Good evening, you are tuned to The Wrong Hero. This is Cafe Cabaret, and our presentation for this evening is called Strenuousness. And speaking of strenuousness, I was kind of hoping to get a picture out of this camera, but um, as you can see, I'm fiddling around with the light, and I'm fiddling around with the positive and negative, but it just doesn't seem to be happening. So I may have to do a audio dub over existing footage, which you know I hate, really, I really hate to do, but I have no real alternative. So anyway, without any further ado, The Wrong Hero in Strenuous. Now we're going to get some static here. Yeah, we're slowly merging into reality. See, now, I don't know about you, but I had the better part of my day planned. And it's already like 7 o'clock, and I haven't really done very much. I mean, I did get all the stuff done today that I had hoped to get done, which was, uh, you know, to wash the uh, pillows and the comforters, the pillowcases and whatnot. And uh, I did some work on a tape, but it's not going to be shown for a long time. So really, it's like I haven't really gotten much at all accomplished. Uh, but who knows? Maybe in the next several days, I can, uh, you know, sort of, sort of get way ahead on my work, so I don't have to worry about these pressing deadlines quite so much. You know that, of course, it is an enormous imposition on me to continue on the way I have been and uh, doing these uh, things at, at such great length. Anyway. Uh, this is the second in a series of uh, more or less political pronunciatos, or call them what you will. And uh, I just hmm, thought it would be interesting just to talk a little bit about politics. Because after all, there's three subjects you're never supposed to talk about. Politics, religion, and something else that I forget, and it's so eminently untalkable about that I can't even recall what it is at the moment. In any event, uh, I guess I can take this logo down. I mean, it's not going to be of much use, or I should say utility. I'll just tear it up. I'm going to check to see if this rain is raining. I guess that uh, extra strength liquid plumber that I bought ended up working. But you know, I'm going to really need the incredibly strong stuff to uh, clean out the uh, bathtub once and for all. I mean, there's just no way around it. you got to pay extra for this stuff. It has the same ingredients as the regular drain opener. They don't tell you to what extent it is different, and yet it costs, oh, I don't know, a dollar forty more. Of course, you know, since I got ahead a 75 cent coupon that I tripled, I ended up buying it for two dollars or 90 cents less than what I would have paid for it had I paid full price without the coupon. Yes, my coupon days are going plenty strong, and uh, this week I managed to accumulate 43 of them. I don't know if I'll use them all. I had 30 last week, and I ended up using every last one of them. Uh, so far I've used 10, and you know, I got all sorts of great stuff. I even uh, you know, got double coupons on some stuff and ended up getting it for free, so in that fashion I saved six of my triple coupons. Um, actually, I did pay 15 cents a can for the refried beans. Uh, that was Depression era prices. Of course, they didn't even have products like that during the Depression, so I'm way ahead of the game, if you really want to know. Uh, so, anyway, Al Gore, it's interesting, Al Gore, the Vice President of the United States, he's already gearing up for a, uh, a, run, a presidential run in the year 2000, which, you know, I, one could hardly begrudge him, after all. Uh, he did serve his time, he will have served his eight years in the most lowly and insignificant job in the world, as Joe Klein puts it, a true Vice President is never who he is. He's always who someone else wants him to be. And uh, someone else said that our past vice presidents are forgotten, vilified, or romanticized. Well, I don't know if anybody's ever going to uh, romanticize uh, Al Gore. I think he'll probably 
uh, enter the list of forgotten American statesmen. A mere footnote in the electoral history of the United States, along with Garrett Hobart Jr. and uh, the somewhat colorful John Cactus Jack Nance Garner from Texas, uh, who I believe was the person who said that the vice presidency wasn't worth a pitcher of warm spit. Although I don't think spit is the word he used. I think it was shit. But uh, it's been romanticized into spit. Everybody knows what he really said. Well, maybe not everybody really knows. Maybe it was piss. I mean, that would make a little more sense. A warm pitcher of shit? What a grotesque image. A warm pitcher of piss? Well, you sort of associate that with beer. Beer comes in pitchers, and some people refer to beer as piss water, especially if it's piss poor beer. So anyway, uh, you know, it's a funny thing in our society that our, our president is sort of like this savior who appears, uh, particularly in the 20th century, which is basically the history of genocidal wars and mass communications. Uh, presidents sort of appear as Jesus might have appeared to the multitudes who gathered in the uh, sort of, you know, primitive television of their day, namely in actual groups around, say, a mountainside to hear someone speak or orate. Uh, it's funny how for like thousands of years prior to television, the means of mass communication was basically oration. And even in the days of radio, uh, oration was somewhat attenuated by the demands of the medium. And, of course, as Marshall McLuhan famously said, the medium is the message. But, nevertheless, oratory was um, a, an essential part of being an American politician. Or, for that matter, I would suspect of being a politi politician of any kind. Hitler was another person who used mass communications, namely the radio, as a means of extending his oratory to a larger segment of the population. But with television, the old style oratory, as exemplified by perhaps its last living example, Hubert Humphrey, was rendered obsolete. And speaking of Hubert Humphrey, now there's a vice president who nobody really is going to remember that well. Um, I mean, what was he basically? He was basically Johnson's straight man, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And uh, well, that's one hell of a role to have to play. And he never became president in his own right. As a matter of fact, he got beaten by Richard Nixon. I mean, of all the sad people who've gotten beaten by Richard Nixon, Helen Gagan Douglas, uh, Adlai Stevenson, and uh, whoever his vice president was, let's see, in 52, I think it was John Sparkman of Alabama. And then in 56, it was, uh, I believe it was Estes Kefauver um, of uh, Tennessee, because uh, Adelaide let the convention be an open convention that year in regards to picking the vice president. And of course, you know, uh, Nixon beat Hubert Humphrey and um, Muskie, his running mate. And uh, Nixon knocked Muskie out of the 72 Democratic race pretty early and, and had to uh, face George McGovern. And um, his vice presidential running mate, Thomas Eagleton, who of course got knocked out and was replaced by Sergeant Shriver. Now there's a real trivia question for you. The vice presidential running mates of losing presidential candidates. Um, oh yeah, that's right. Jack Kemp, that was Bob Dole's running mate. So again, Jack Kemp of Buffalo, former football player, has his, his foot in two fields of endeavor, both politics and sports, as a footnote of sorts. Unless, of course, he becomes president in the year 2000. Running against Al Gore or uh, or Gephardt or whoever it is the Democrats field. I mean, if it's Kemp, Kemp Gore, great. Four and four fits right on the marquee. But as I've often said, politics is sports for people who are too fat to run. Which is not to say that Kemp couldn't stand to lose a few pounds or that Al Gore isn't basically just a hulking mesomorph blown up the poster side. But that's neither here nor there. Yes. Presidents are our saviors, and uh, even if their role is to limit government, they are nonetheless our saviors. And this, this whole
whole notion of president as savior goes all the way back to George Washington, but just to hit some highlights of the president as savior theme, Jefferson was the savior of the farmers and the slaveholders and the agrarian class, and uh, Jackson was the uh, savior of the common man, and um, Lincoln was the savior of the Union and the forces who were striving for peace and abolition of slavery. And, um, uh, well, then, you know, history sort of uh, uh, takes a little holiday for the next 30 years after Lincoln. And then we have McKinley, who was the savior of the, uh, the wealthy, because, of course, he was running against William Jennings Bryant. And then there was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who living memory commemorates as the savior of the country during the Depression. And um, did you ever notice that new monument they have to FDR? His dog, Fala, is there prominently in the foreground. Fala seems just a little bigger than life size. Maybe it's because FDR is seated, as indeed he should be, since he is, in fact, was wheelchair bound for the entirety of his presidency and for, in fact, much of his career. Um, but the thing is, the way he's seated, his gigantic cloak covers what looks suspiciously to me to be a rather large wheelchair. Now, there's an interesting sidelight. FDR only allowed people to see him in a wheelchair when he was talking to, you know, soldiers who had recently become incapacitated and um, were paralyzed and had become wheelchair bound. Then, of course, he was a living testimonial as well as savior to the men who felt that they had no real purpose in life and no real rationale to go on, since, of course, they were crippled. Um, anyway, a president has to be uh, something of an activist like Ronald Reagan, um, even if he's like an activist in reverse and serves to limit government. Um, yes. And because presidents have to be saviors, they almost always end up being crucified in some way. Now, they can't be constantly going out and doing great things because there are very few occasions in American history when truly great deeds were necessary. So basically what the president is, is a stopgap, of of, in a way, between the forces of absolute corruption and greed and the forces of absolute goodness and reform, although um, reform might not, in fact, always be good, so perhaps we should say he's a stopgap between the, the rad radicals of one side, or one political extreme, and the radicals of another. Now, say what you will, we've never really had a truly left-wing president. Jimmy Carter, uh, well, maybe he was a little lefty on uh, human rights issues overseas, but uh, he was a pretty conservative guy otherwise. Um, if anything liberal happened in his regime, it was because of the political appointments he made. Being a political outsider to Washington, he um, had to sort of pick and choose uh, from a rather smaller batch of uh, people, some of whom happened to be pretty left-wing. People say Bill Clinton is left-wing, but he doesn't really live up to that kind of uh, uh, reputation. And Well, FDR was uh, rather left-wing by today's standards, perhaps, but uh, he was far from being a socialist, although he did nationalize certain industries, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, the, the electric company there. Um, he didn't nationalize the railroads, which was on the socialist agenda since 1988. It took the bankruptcy of the Penn Central in 1970 for Amtrak to be formed. And of course, now they're constantly trying to uh, deprive Amtrak of money and shut it down <laughs> as far as they can. Uh, somehow trains aren't seen as being a necessary part of the infrastructure, which of course is just bogus, man. Of course they are, dude. Uh, so anyway, the problem with the pres you know, being president these days, you don't have the kind of absolute power that would enable you to create true lasting change. And when people ask me for change for a dollar, I always tell them, we will never see lasting change unless we are willing to spend billions of dollars and expend energy far in excess of that amount. But uh, anyway, 
In order to be a great president, you almost have to manufacture a crisis and then solve it, much like the volunteer fireman who goes around setting fires that he can then put out and win the acclaim of the humble townspeople. But the last time someone tried that stunt was during the Gulf War, and the lingering afterglow of heroism that George Bush enjoyed as a result of that incursion was uh, rather short-lived, as uh, we, we noticed um, in 1992 when Bill Clinton, corruption rattled and uh, very problematic in his personal character, managed to defeat George Bush. The thing is, it was a wonder that George Bush ever won election in the first place, just as it was kind of a wonder that uh, John Major, you know, that guy that was Prime Minister of England but now is Tony Blair, it's, it's a wonder that John Major ever won. I mean, Bush and Major, you know, they were both rather colorless and uncharismatic types of people. And uh, in any event, history will not long remember the name of the man who John Major defeated in his last election. I believe it was Neil Kinnock. And uh, he was actually a socialist. You see, the, uh, the only way labor was able to win with Tony Blair is to rescind Clause 4, which called for the nationalization of resources. Um, so John Major is sort of like a watered-down, you know, I mean, Tony Blair is just kind of like a watered-down John Major, and that's how he won. So anyway, uh, it's kind of dangerous to have a president, is what I'm getting at, because they, they want their place in history, they, they want people to really look up to them in a post-ironic age, where, uh, would that it were actually post-ironic, um, it's entirely ironic in virtually every way, and there's nothing post-ironic about it, but I just say post-ironic in the same sense as post-modernist means uh, something that's perhaps imperfectly modernist, or an extension of modernism taken to its uh, sort of a ridiculous degree. Post-irony in this context also signifies uh, irony taken to a somewhat ludicrous degree. Uh, Anyway, as long as we're on this subject, there's, there's somebody who says, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you win or lose, it, it just matters how you play the game. Well, of course, you know, the guy that said that was a loser. I don't need to tell you. So, uh, anyway... Bob Dole. There was an obvious sort of uh, parallel between Bob Dole and an old-time pirate or privateer or corsair. And of course there are shades of distinction between these entities. Let's say it was just an old-time buccaneer who tried to buck the system and didn't quite make it. As a matter of fact, I think he's now more esteemed than he would have been if, through some miracle, he had managed to overcome Bill Clinton. As a matter of fact, I suspect that if he ran against Bill Clinton in 1992, he might very well have won. Uh, Clinton wasn't entrenched back in 92. Dole could have then, at that point at least, plausibly said that um, Clinton was unreliable, um, untrustworthy. And of course, if Dole had had a killer vice president tagging along for the ride, but let's not talk of what if, or if only, or I would and I could, because such discussions are basically, bleh, I don't know, redundant, I mean, reductive, I should say. It, they don't really accomplish much of anything, so... It doesn't matter. It's like, what if Hitler had won World War II? Of course, my theory is he did. We just don't know it. And we're still living with the consequences. And um, in any event, I guess what I'm getting at here is um, the presidential election is uh, kind of odd because you have to uh, fight it in 50 states. It's not a national election. It's 
done through the Electoral College, a shrewd device which ensures, or was meant to ensure, I suppose on one level, that none of the states would be neglected in the presidential sweepstakes. But if anything, it had the opposite effect. Because now the candidates have to fight for the battleground states um, and devote most of their time, effort, money, and attention to those. Whereas if it really were a national election, then the president could barely afford to discount even so much as one vote. Kennedy, of course, only won by about the number of precincts in the entire United States. So don't ever let anybody say that your vote doesn't count, because even though it doesn't, there are conceivably circumstances where it might possibly make a difference. So uh, anyway, uh, I guess the real political, the real hardcore political junkies are kind of bumming out now, because, I mean, it's been like six months since the election, and I mean, they're just sitting on their hands now, kind of waiting until uh, at least the next congressional elections, which actually are coming up. Of course, the really shrewd ones are already out there, at least on the presidential level, stumping. This would be the time to attach yourself to the Gephardt campaign if you, if you were, you were going to back a relative long shot and uh, somehow sweep to political glory. Trouble is, if you're over 30, forget it. I mean, you might get a job as a policy wonk, but you're not really going to be in the inner circle if you're very much older than 30. Politics is a young man's game. I know that most of the elected stooges are over 40, but if you want to really be one of those people that keeps the nuts and bolts running, um, then you really want to be uh, in your 20s. That's the only time you really have any energy. In my brief involvement with the Carter campaign, I was at the tender age of 23, well, 22, 23. So, uh, I know whereof I speak. So, anyway, it's, it's sort of interesting, um, because the loser in one election might very well, or the loser of one war might very well turn out to have won after all many years later. Like, for example, uh, the Populist Party was sort of absorbed into the Democratic and Republican parties, respectively. The, uh, the sort of three silver economic monetarist populists were more or less absorbed into the Democratic Party of William Jennings Bryan. And the conservative family values, farmer, agrarian, nationalistic branch of populism was more or less absorbed into the Republican Party, although that, of course, that progress was more gradual in occurring. Um, but most of the things that the progressives wanted have, in fact, been enacted. Of course, uh, it took 40 to 60 years to happen, but nationalization of railroads, uh, the eight-hour day, guaranteed um, unemployment benefits, Things which at the time seemed like wildly radical demands turn out to be today's status quo. And it's just in that way that uh, maybe Bill Clinton lost the fight for health care now, but maybe down the road he will be seen as somebody who attempted to uh, do something about the issue and brought it into public focus. Or in just the way that Goldwater suffered a humiliating defeat in 1964, but because conservatives had somebody to band around and uh, get together over, um, a mere 16 years later, Ronald Reagan became our president. So, in any event, I just found out something interesting. You can sign anybody's signature as long as, and you don't even need their permission, you can sign anybody's signature for them if you have a reason to believe that if they knew about it, they'd say it was okay. I mean, it's kind of like borrowing somebody's car uh, and 
getting into an accident, and then they say, the first thing they want to know is, let me see the license and registration. Is this your car? Uh, no. Well, whose car is it? Uh, so-and-so's car. Well, do they know you have it? Uh, well, uh, why don't you call them and, uh, uh, yeah, I'll have a little discussion with them there, and, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure they know, and if they don't, well, it's okay, they sort of gave me permission, although they didn't actually come out and say I could borrow it, but I know that they would have let me borrow it if, as a matter of fact, um, I had expressed a need to do so, but, well, you know, it's 4 a.m., they were sleeping, they had to get up for work, I didn't want to bother them, I just sort of took it out for a little spin. Sorry about that, officer. Anyway, um, maybe someday outer space aliens will be a campaign issue, in much the same way that uh, communists and subversives were a presidential campaign issue <coughs> in 1952. So, in any event, if you were going to write a play about the 1996 election, I mean, what would you discuss? Uh, Bob Dole's feebleness? I, the 96 election wasn't really very interesting. Not nearly as interesting as the 92 election. It's sort of like history repeats itself. Uh, history is the first time tragedy the second time farce, if you want to go that far. Um, anyway, <coughs> see, Bill Clinton is far from being a fanatic because he's like almost the exact opposite of a fanatic. Instead of saying everything that he believes, he really, really doesn't profess any profound belief in anything that he doesn't think he'll be backed up on by at least the plurality of the American people. I guess he learned from his mistakes because, you know, the whole gays in the military flap. And yet, in a way, he's winning. The cultural atmosphere is changing under Bill Clinton. That's sort of the difference between a liberal and a conservative. A, a liberal wants to use politics to change the culture, and the conservative merely wants to preserve the culture and, um, pre, you know, uh, by engaging in politics as usual. So, that's sort of the way things work out. Or, as, Ra as uh, Arthur Miller says, actions are as irrelevant during cultural and religious wars as they are in nightmares. The thing at issue is buried intentions, the secret allegiances of the alienated heart, always the main threat to the theocratic mind, as well as its immemorial quarry. I mean, in a way, communism was that deviance in the 50s, but now there is no more communism. So, in a sense, um, being either in favor of racism or vehemently against it is one of those secret allegiances of the alienated heart that Arthur Miller is um, talking about. Bill Clinton does have certain parallels to Franklin Delano Roosevelt in that he tends to improvise. But uh, the way he improvises, he doesn't really improvise from his core convictions. Many accuse him of having none. Well, he does have them. They're just well concealed. Because, uh, well, I don't think many of them are viable nowadays. These are different times. And he's changed with the times. He's not really uh, the president of the baby boomers. He's sort of like the president of the slightly older, not quite baby boomer uh, individual, the sort of people who weren't old enough to fight in World War II, but um, were, I don't know, uh, he, he sort of acts more like a person who was born in uh, 1941 instead of 1947 or whenever he was born. I guess he was born in 1946, 
which puts him at the very top of the baby boomer demographic cohort. So, anyway, um, he sort of grew up in the cultural milieu of the baby boomer, but everything in the South is like 10 years behind what, it's, what it is in Los Angeles or New York, to a certain degree. And in the heartland, you might almost say it's 20 years behind. Right now, they're just getting into punk rock. I mean, uh, how backward, right? It's almost like uh, in the heartland and down south, it sort of passes over the parents, but it hits their kids right where they live. And it could take 10 years, it could take 20. It really depends. Well, it all comes down to uh, what I've always said. Whatever is not forbidden will be compulsory in the future. It's nice to sort of uh, put that type of spin on the future. It's sort of, when you say these silly little epigrams, and epi you know, it, <coughs> they always become much more portentous and consequential when you use the device of simply putting the phrase in the future prior to it. Or ITF, as I like to call it. Well, the thing is, um, if you can't, like if your policy initiative fails, then you replace it with a lukewarm, watered-down version of the same thing, just like like the spiteful teenager who you tell him to quit quit making that rapping noise. Stop it. And he does that, you know. One little extra rap just to let you know that he is willing to stop it on his own terms. It's like the bum that you give a cigarette and he tears the filter off. He is willing to accept the gift from you, but only on his own terms. It's like uh, people are forced to customize their own policy initiatives in politics, particularly in American politics. And as we all know, America is a democratic republic where the will of the people is done, provided it doesn't clash with the will of the corporations who control the country. In other words, the will of the people be done just so long as corporations make money. Now, there can't be many people that are very happy about the flight of labor from the United States to the less industrialized countries where a great many of the uh, functions of the Industrial Revolution can be carried out at one-tenth the cost. And there is finally, at long last, beginning to be something of a of a backlash against that. The whole Kathy Lee sweatshop deal is a part of it. The whole, uh, you know, Nike shoes uh, are made by slave labor in China type deal. See, the, the thing is though, I mean, people will be resentful of something as a means of avoiding the hard truths of a global economy. Like, they'll it's, it's their sort of impotent way of responding to the notion that um, big corporations are predatory and greedy. Instead of trying to do something about that, maybe have more regulations concerning uh, combinations of capital, as they attempted to do during the Progressive Era. Uh, now instead, though, they focus their ire and their rage on third world countries. Um, it's sort of like... Um, the revenge of the underdog. It's sort of like, well, we can't throw rocks at IBM, so let's piss on China instead. I mean, it's kind of the way things are shaping up now, or shaking out, as the case may be. Um, IBM good, China bad. <laughs> it's, it's a very reductive way of uh, putting it, but hey, I'm just making this stuff up as I go along. Well, I don't know. Uh, 
See, there just aren't that many people. There are so few people willing to go out on a limb for a certain fixed idea that they might have that they're frequently stigmatized as being weird or aberrant or bizarre in politics once they do. Bill Clinton with health care, gays in the military, his wife is his equal partner. People had a lot of the same complaints about FDR, that his wife was his equal partner, that he's selling the country down the river, getting involved in wars that we have no business being involved in, um, and, uh, you know, socialism and all that sort of thing. It's funny, though. People used to attack Roosevelt, not so much for his personal qualities, but for his policy. Now, nowadays, people are sort of soft-pedaling the notion that Bill Clinton can be attacked for his policies, and instead going after him on a personal level when they go after him at all. So, anyway, what happens in politics is that folks kind of decide that they're on one side or another. It's almost like a, a I don't know, a, a kabuki rite or, or a no dance or a Japanese tea ceremony. I mean, there's this incredibly ritualized aspect to the way in which people engage in political regu r rhetoric and the ensuing arguments which evolve from the rhetoric. So, as Grace Paley put it, what this results in is enormous changes at the last minute. It's almost like politicians are, I don't know, e eternally um, behind on their coursework in school, and so they pull all-nighters at the last possible minute in order to uh, accomplish anything. But, uh, well, What's kind of interesting is politics tends to, uh, because it's the work of committees, quintessentially so, uh, politics tends to avoid extremes and water everything down. I mean, politics is not really, in, to any great extent, practiced entirely by the book, nor is it practiced as a sort of extreme improvisation at any particular moment. In other words, um, when a the captain of the good ship politics charts his course, he doesn't always stick rigorously to the map, but nor does he meander about aimlessly, hitting one island, tacking off to the open sea, changing his mind at the last minute, going back to that damn island, but the island metaphor is useful because there's certain islands which the captain of the ship of state seems to be irresistibly attracted to, in much the same way that Ulysses was irresistibly attracted to the sirens. And of course one of those islands is the waging of war. And another of those islands is promising to cut taxes while at the same time giving everybody the goodies which they are convinced are their birthright. So, essentially, it's as though we know the way that our national voyages have turned out in the, in the past. Uh, we know the mistakes that the captains of our continental keels have made in times past, but we seem to be irresistibly attracted to making the same types of mistakes over and over again, uh, sort of washing, a, washing, a, always washing ashore on the same sandbars, like you know, picking on South America and Central America and Mexico. We always wash ashore on that same sandbar, or exploiting the labor potential of China 
and yet at the same time expecting them to live up to some sort of idealized human rights notions that we have of our people. We blame China for not being democratic, and yet we exploit them because they are not a democracy, and therefore their people are willing to work for what we would consider to be a pittance, or a mere pittance, as it's almost inevitably referred to. Anyway, there's an awful lot of stupid conservatives out there. The counterpoint, or counterpart actually, to the knee-jerk liberal who reacts blindly to, um, to the issues simply on the basis of a preconceived and pre-digested ideology. The counterpoint is like, I wouldn't call it the knee-jerk conservative. Let's call it something like the non-autonomous conservative. sort of the dystopic conservative. In a, in a world which is depending on the future to solve its problems, the conservative is almost stubbornly rooted in past solutions and past mistakes to present day problems which call for enlightened, progressive, forward-moving thinking. And nowhere is this more true than the issue of environmentalism. Now, in the early part of the century, conservationism was a profoundly conservative viewpoint. That's because our natural resources hadn't yet been exploited to the degree that they could be considered or that people could foresee a time when they would be finite. Therefore, conservationism was basically a conservative impulse. Now, however, when conservationism really involves the science of ecology, which in turn involves making crucial and difficult decisions which may not enhance the selfish lifestyles of a commodity-driven peoples, now that ecology demands future thinking rather than mere conservation of past resources, then, because of that, it becomes the bugbear or bugaboo of the conservative thinker. Anyway, conservatives of this type often accuse liberals and ecologists of uh, being almost addicted to unhappiness, determined to make life miserable. And of course, they are able to persuade the great mass of people that without our exploitation of natural resources, we'll all soon be freezing in the dark. That was a particularly popular expression in the 1970s. And yet, this cruel, irrational type of conservatism bids fair to promulgate and promote even more misery than all but the most deep of the deep ecologists has ever proposed to promote. In other words, it's like pay your medicine now and live a better life. Take your medicine now and there's the possibility that although we may be living under reduced circumstances, nonetheless we will have enough and be relatively happy. The conservative is saying, let's eat up all the seed corn. Who cares about tomorrow? There's always more where that came from. <clears throat> In any event, the president, very few mayors of American cities have ever become president. Let's see, there was uh, Grover Cleveland. I think he was the sheriff of Buffalo, though. Gee, I'm not sure. I'm getting a little uh, confused here. I can't think offhand of any mayors who ever became president, and relatively few mayors of large cities have even been considered in the running for the presidency. The last one I can think of was John Lindsay, who was the uh, mayor of uh, New York City and um, a liberal Republican. 
And then, of course, there was Diane Feinstein, uh, the mayor of San Francisco at one time. But uh, no, not too many mayors ever really make the grade. And that's because the mayor tends to personify his city, whereas the president has to go beyond mere personification. It's almost impossible to personify the United States. You can only, in a sense, personify a certain image of the United States at a certain time. It's almost like you're personifying a cohort. Um, you know, Bob Dole, one more mission for the World War II generation. Uh, Bill Clinton, the, the return of the repressed, the revenge of the baby boomer. So, uh, I don't know. It's, it's a funny thing about using the mayorality or the mayoralty as the uh, stepping stone to the presidency. It just doesn't happen very often. Uh, more often, the governorship of a substantial state is more likely to lead to the presidency. But when we think back of the governors who have become presidents, not all of them have been happy, and many of them have been Democrats. Let's see. Um, FDR was the... Was he the governor of New York? No, I don't think he ever was. That was Al Smith. Um, yeah, he was the governor of New York. Okay. Nelson Rockefeller, vice president under the Ford administration from 1974 until 1976, was the governor of New York as well. Um, Truman was a senator. See, we're only stretching back as far as, let's see, Calvin Coolidge was governor of Massachusetts, I believe. And as governor, he put down a police strike, which brought him to na the national prominence, which made him a vice president in the first place. H.L. Uh, Lincoln said that he cited a reporter as saying that Calvin Coolidge was the luckiest son of a bitch who ever lived. Uh, Warren G. Harding, I think, was, uh, was he the governor of Ohio? I think he was. He had been mayor of some small town in Ohio at one time, but he was also a publisher. So he wasn't solely in politics. He was like very photogenic, almost like a matinee idol, um, and he was involved in the press. Very few press moguls ever become president. Um, very few even bother running. Horace Greeley ran against Grant uh, in 1872. That was about the only example that immediately springs to mind. Um, and, uh, well, LBJ ran some TV stations, but that was a result of his political shenanigans and not really um, the other way around. And, uh, no, not very many mayors ever become president, and the governors who do become president, their regimes are not always happy ones. Eisenhower was never really governor of anything. Um, Jack Kennedy was a senator. Nixon was a senator. Um, LBJ was a senator. And, um, of course, there was Jimmy Carter. He was the governor of Georgia, one-term governor of Georgia at that and one-term president to boot. Ronald Reagan, famously, was the governor of California. And George Bush really wasn't much of anything. I mean, he ran for Congress in Texas and was beaten by Lloyd Benson, of all people. Uh, of course, Dukakis was the governor of Massachusetts. And if he had been as wan and colorless as Calvin Coolidge, well, he almost was, actually. He might have stood a better chance against George Bush, the wan and colorless incumbent vice president who he ran against. Um, and Bill Clinton, of course, was the governor of Arkansas. And the biggest argument against his election might well have been, look at Arkansas. If only Bush had, like, had the gumption to just keep repeating that simplistic mantra over and over. You want to know what... Clinton as president is going to be like? Look at Arkansas. Well, I guess it's sort of time for me to take a little break. The whole point of this is, uh, to quote what Sid Blumenthal has said, almost everyone who rises to power in Washington 
comes from somewhere else. Now, the big exception is George Bush. The exception that proves the rule. Which, of course, you know, what that really means is uh, the exception that tests the rule. But, you know, he was a protege. Um, he was the good, second-rate, number two man that every president relies upon. So I will uh, pick up this stream of thought a little later on this evening. Well, actually, no. I mean, I'm just going to continue. I'm just going to pause, but you won't know it. This is The Wrong Hero. You are tuned to Cafe Cabaret. And the title of this presentation is Strenuousness. Well, I'm back. The Wrong Hero. With the presentation entitled Strenuousness. Now, I should say, now that we're near the halfway point, that strenuousness refers uh, to something that was said about... Um, gee, who was it said about? Dewey. Dewey, the failed presidential candidate who ran against Roosevelt in 1944 and against Truman in 1948 and was a two-time loser. Three-time loser if you count the time he tried to get Richard Nixon to drop off the vice presidential ticket in the wake of the scandals which threatened to torpedo the ultimately successful 1952 Eisenhower presidential run. In any event, it was said that the chief characteristic of a man like Dewey was strenuousness. Now, I suppose I've sort of gotten a little bit off the track, but, uh, Anyway, now that the election's over, we can start talking about year 2000, or 2K-365, as some people might be tempted to call it, and the probable candidates in that primary election in both parties. Now, I don't think Gore is so strong as to preclude a primary runoff between him, Gephardt, and whatever other dang fool Democrat thinks that they're going to get the kitty with all the goodies inside. Now, you should know that Lamar Alexander is already running in the year 2000 sweepstakes. Dan Quayle and George Bush Jr. have made noises about running, but one person who's perhaps ideally situated on the Republican side to win all of the primary votes necessary to gain the nomination is probably Jack Kemp. Now, some have said that Kemp offers a mix of nutty criticisms and artificial disagreements. Ghetto dwellers are not about to vote Republican, no matter what Mr. Kemp says. So... That would seem to uh, pretty much uh, write off Jack Kemp. And I must say, I do have some reservations about Mr. Kemp's theories, some of which I think are r rather irresponsible, to say the least. Well, what about that Strom Thurmond, huh? He's the oldest incumbent senator ever. Period. Well, he's been in that office since, what, 1954? Something like that? I guess, yeah, it makes it uh, 1956. Uh, he's been in office for 41 years. Now, it's interesting what they said about him in The Economist. 
Give me what I want or I'll cry, they said about his recent election. Only the very old or the very young could possibly get away with this. Many in South Carolina feared that if Thurman, 93, was defeated, the distress would kill him, and their consciences would not permit them to risk that. If Thurman, in fact, does serve his entire term, by its conclusion, he will be 99 years old, and uh, perhaps the oldest senator ever. Well, yeah, it's a funny world. And as my daddy likes to say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Well, it's seldom a good sign, says Charles Krauthammer, when a Republican presidential candidate gets praised for not going negative on his opponent. Dole's physical courage was beyond doubt. It was his political courage that was suspect. Well, as for Kemp's chances of getting the Republican nomination, can I just say this? In 1992, says Fred Barnes, the Bush White House greeted Quayle's return from the vice presidential debate with a South Lawn rally. When Quayle's limo arrived, Bush rushed out to shake his hand as White House aides cheered. On October 10th, the day after Kemp debated Gore, the GOP candidate appeared together, candidates appeared together in Cincinnati. Dole thanked Kemp for doing a great job and turned away as Kemp addressed the crowd. So I imagine Dole will still be around in the year 2000 um, to cheer Kemp on. Of course, the two never were the best of friends, and uh, Kemp was something of a loose cannon, and uh, who knows just how much Bob Dole will be able to do for Kemp. Well, he might help with the fundraising. Seems as though Dole has a real knack for coming up with $300,000, as in that recent uh, thing where he gave Gingrich 300 k to pay off those that, that, that fine that he incurred. Gingrich, says David Brooks, really is Maggie Thatcher's American counterpart. He just can't resist going into enemy territory. So, yes, all this, I'm sure, is fascinating to you. But, I don't know. Maybe it isn't. You know, the machinery of the presidential nomination is such that it constitutes, in a sense, an enormous backdrop for whoever the Democratic or Republican nominee eventually turns out to be. It's almost as though there's a cardboard cutout which is blank until the party machinery decides in a process resembling that of survival of the fittest, although in this case the Darwinian criteria is the ability to raise massive amounts of money, combined with a willingness to feed red meat to the core constituents. Um, see, now that was Graham's problem. Uh, remember Phil Graham? He raised all that money. He got maybe like one delegate or something ridiculous like that, or five or ten delegates. I mean, not since... Um, uh, John Connolly in 1980 in the primaries who uh, got exactly one delegate and spent over a million dollars to get it, get the delegate, the million dollar delegate. Has a Republican candidate for the presidency done so poorly as Phil Graham? You can pretty much write him off, but Graham did prove one thing, that no matter how much money you raise, if people just plain don't like you, you just haven't got a chance. You can feed them red meat, you can raise a jillion dollars, but if you just don't look like a president and if people just don't really like you very much and if people just plain get the willies when they think of you as the president, then you haven't got a chance. Now, I don't think there's anybody out there 
who really thinks or really thought that the election of Bob Dole to the presidency would uh, ruin or destroy this country. Now, there are quite a few people who may think that the election of Dan Quayle could result in ruining the country, or at the very least, um, that Quayle would be uh, sort of a, a, a useful idiot, to use communist terminology, and that he would be controlled by a cabal of uh, sinister right-wingers, such as those who uh, attracted themselves to Eugene Pulliam, Dan Quayle's father-in-law. Dan Quayle's father, in fact, the, Dan Quayle was the scion of a influential Indiana newspaper family, the Pulliams. In any event, to quote from Tucker Carlson, if it is true that a modern political campaign is little more than a theatrical presentation, then the advance men are its rotary, roadies, gaffers, and choreographers. They attend to the thousand details that make a successful rally possible. They attempt to orchestrate the picture, the footage or photograph that will end up defining the event for the rest of the country. As Jeffrey Weiss says, the picture is everything. And of course a bad picture, a bad photo op, such as the disastrous Dukakis riding around in a tank photograph of 1988, can just as easily sink a campaign as a good picture can define the campaign in a crucial way, which enables the person who is standing in the foreground against the backdrop to win election. So, more about the picture and advancement. Bob Dole's advancement were the last of the true believers on the Republican presidential campaign. They had the ability to talk themselves into believing what they have to believe to get up in the morning and go cheerfully to work. Now, you might say, sure, Bob Dole lost the election, but in the long one run, the Republicans more or less uh, maintained the status quo ante. There was a Democratic president and a divided Congress, a Republican Congress before, and the result is still the same. They didn't win, but they didn't really lose. Anyway, more about the picture. The candidate, of course, stands in the foreground of the picture. But what is the picture? How does one get a good picture? Once again, the quote from Tucker Carlson. Attention to detail makes a good picture, and advanced men labor to let no detail pass unnoticed. Moments before Dole is scheduled to conduct a live TV interview with the Fox News Channel, an advanced man determines that books might distract from the day's intended message. The volumes, The Age of Delirium, Hazardous Duty, and The Making of a Catastrophe were replaced by a Rush Limbaugh book. Now, you ever notice when you watch Rush Limbaugh's television show, which I imagine you probably never did, he had hundreds of copies of his book in back of them. Some, pe some people just go a little too far. Well, it's interesting uh, that um, there is a, a very specialized language, much akin to Carney talk, that people who work for presidential campaigns or political campaigns in general have. For example, chum means flags, signs, pom-poms, foam fingers, and other political trinkets. In any event, 
It was perhaps the most boring, unexciting, unstimulating, or at least understimulating presidential campaign <laughs> since who knows when. It, you had to think back quite a bit. I guess the nearest parallel in recent times would be the uh, Walter Mondale, Ronald Reagan presidential campaign. Well, you know, I mean, Mondale wasn't exactly Mr. Excitement. And uh, because Reagan had already been in office for the last four years, many voters didn't seem to think there was much at stake by allowing the Reagan regime to continue. It's interesting, however, that Bob Dole did not lose by the gigantic 20-point margin that the pollsters were predicting right up till the last week of the election. Now, John Major, on the other hand, did lose by a spectacular margin. Now, the importance of the picture is, uh, has been commented on by uh, the same individual, Tucker Carlson. He said that a campaign staffer said to him, We kept putting Dole into Reagan-esque settings. Only problem is, he was not Reagan. And that just sort of about sums it up. I have a feeling that if somehow Reagan could have been reincarnated, then perhaps Dole might have stood a chance. It's interesting that because the margin was somewhat closer than people expected, that both houses of Congress did not fall to the Democrats. Although it was a very near thing. Now, Ralph Nader, who also, as you recall, ran against Bob Dole, Ross Perot, and Bill Clinton, and managed to get a whopping 1% of the vote, on speaking of Bill Clinton, said, I've known him since he served as Attorney General of Arkansas in the 1970s, and he's a complete opportunist. He only respects power, and he defines power as corporate power which explains why he went headlong into GATT and NAFTA. And Ralph Nader has a point. And if you want to know who I voted for in the 1996 election, well, that's privileged information. But if you guessed it was Ralph Nader, who knows? You might be correct. I would say I was responsible for at least two of the votes that Ralph Nader managed to get. Clinton, says Nader, wouldn't even have qualified as a Rockefeller Republican 20 years ago. For you see, Nelson Rockefeller, despite his distinguished name and the reputation in the hist history of the Rockefeller family, was actually considered one of those patrician liberal Republicans, which uh, are now, for all practical purposes, an entirely extinct breed. When you compare Clinton to some of the Republican presidents of times past, why, he wasn't even as, he's, a, he's more of a conservative than someone like Richard Nixon ended up being. He's more of a conservative than someone like Alf Landon ended up being. Ralph Nader seems to think that since we're underdeveloped in civil infrastructure, that is the top priority of government. <coughs> what Nader fails to understand is that most Americans don't even know what infrastructure is, and if they did, they probably still wouldn't consider it a very sexy issue. What? You're going to raise my property taxes just to build a couple of highways and sewers? No way. It's my money, and I'm going to keep it. See, that's the uh, selfish, conservative, Republican impulse at work. Now, I don't like to pay taxes. I certainly don't feel like chipping in my fair share. But I do it anyway. I don't go around <coughs> irresponsibly electing officials 
who promise pie in the sky by and by and end up wrecking our economy just because I want to save a few lousy bucks. Well, Ralph Nader also commented on, inevitably, the need for campaign finance reform and said acerbically, you need 60 million bucks just to get on the screen. But I don't know, somehow, if Ralph Nader had spent 60 million bucks, well, I don't know, he might have gotten 5% of the vote and qualified for matching funds. But then again, you might not have. It's not like they're spending their own money, after all. They get all these corporate fat caps to give them money. They sell the country out to the highest bidder. Well, as Dick Lamb said, I am haunted by John Locke's statement that hell is truth seen too late. One reason that uh, Lamb lost so badly to Ross Perot in those uh, so-called primaries was that, according to uh, uh, Mr. Lehman, Nicholas Lehman, Dick Lamb completely lacks the paralytic fear of offending anyone. A man after my own heart. Dick Lamb said of himself, I am almost obsessive. I am type A, which I control through exercise. Well, I think uh, he and I are sounding more and more alike except for the exercise part. To say I'm not disappointed is a bit like the captain of the Titanic trying to persuade the passengers that they're only stopping for ice, said Dick Lamb on losing the Reform Party nomination to Ross Perot. That's a laugh, isn't it? He lost the Reform Party nomination because Ross Perot cheated. Now, there's an example of uh, uh, a party that uh, is after my own heart. The, the Reform Party ends up, the, the, one, the one party that supposedly is calling for campaign finance reform is the one party that's the most unscrupulous when it comes to living up to those high principles. I will endorse him as prescient, says the witty lamb, but I will not endorse him as president. Say, they cloned a sheep. Maybe they could clone Dick Lamb as well. Anyway, the difference between mavericks and imposters is that the former never have anything to lose. The latter have everything to hide. Once again, Dick Lamb on Ross Perot. as long as we're doing this post-mortem of events which took place nearly six months ago. More than six months ago, by my reckoning. Well, you know, the thing is, uh, when you're a conservative, changing old habits is almost as bad as the prospect of death. So it's, it's, it's hardly surprising that that uh, self-described right-wingers behave the way they do. Well, Norman Mailer said, Sweet Billy Clinton didn't have enough ethics, didn't have enough ethics to worry that he was betraying his ethics. Billy could cry for others as quickly as another man zips up his pants, says the acerbic. Norman Mailer of Bill Clinton. Corporate suits own Clinton's nuts, says the somewhat profane Norman Mailer. On Hillary Clinton and the marriage of William Blythe Clinton and Hillary Rodham Clinton, marry incompatibles get twice as many votes, says that oracular sage Norman Mailer. Failing memory is the fastest growing disease 
of the 20th century, says the himself somewhat forgetful Norman Mailer. Jesse Jackson may be our greatest orator, but his voice is sometimes muffled by all his withheld sounds, rage of frustration, clamped down sobs of exasperation, the dark vibration of this year's patience compressed upon last year's patience. Sometimes you can hardly hear him, says the decidedly insightful Norman Mailer. The average Republican speakers had been getting away with too much for decades. The Cold War had produced an instrument panel of reflex buttons that could be pressed for every political need. I am against godless materialism, and so such speakers had lost the ability to rise to an occasion. Too many of the Republicans lived in the oxymoron of the, the biggest oxymoron of them all. They were rich Christians. So they had been cursed with bad conscience for decades, and it had left them full of the kind of minor league hatred that does not produce heart-rousing orators. Norman Mailer goes on to state, Having mastered the fundamental rule of such prose, never be ashamed that you are shameless, the good hack knows how to harvest full returns from an assembly of the pious. Finally, summing it up, true equality would insist that the weak had just as much right to be cruel, vicious, and criminal as the strong. <coughs> Speaking of which, <coughs> Dad Quayle, shall we see him as our repertory, sorry, repertory juvenile? I think so. In the aura of his charisma, says Norman Mailer of Newt Gingrich, there was a rancid pustule. Something vain and self-centered came off him, and the public reacted to that. He was too full of hatred, and it showed itself no matter what role he was playing on a given night. When a remark did not receive enough laughter, Norman Mailer said of Governor Pataki, Pataki would keep his mouth open as if, all else failing, he could still catch a fly. The best of politics was to be with fellow politicians. For a little while, they did not have to pretend to be honest, upright, responsible, and keepers of the light. Man, that Norman Mailer, he's just like uh, crackling with insights. For Dole, optimism was equal to the distance a human being can journey from his origins. If God did not exist, the Republicans would have had to invent him. The American political body has evolved into a highly controlled and powerfully manipulated democracy, overseen by a new species of aristocracy, formed at the junction of four royal families the $10,000 suits of the mega corporations, the titans of the media, and the high ogres of Congress, and the upper lords of the White House. The Republican and Democratic conventions can be seen as one. Family values would prevail in both parties, except in those special cases when this might interfere with mega-sized profits. This was in, uh, all these quotes come from not the nation, but George Magazine from November of 1996. Republicans had often been left with dry, hard-edged specimens of women or 
obese cuties with beehive hairdos. Ice blondes can hide a variety of faults. They cannot convince you, however, of their loving care when they are not feeling it. Mailer basically says that modern day politicians offer PTA solutions to profound problems. Actually, in both instances, he was referring to Hillary Clinton. Women are as ugly as men when personal power is their life cause, their only real life cause. History, says Norman Mailer, is irony. On Bill Clinton, Norman Mailer says, he had the kind of speech that a man running for mayor in a small city might give to the locals. He was bringing the presidency down to the level of the folk and suggesting it was democracy, when in fact it was flim-flam. Would, however, that Mr. Mailer had turned his talents to writing a political novel instead of his current novel in which he purports to be the son of God. Clinton's punishment for his sins was that he had become intellectually dull. He was so bright. He was worthy of becoming a great character in a novel. It wasn't what he had done, but what he had failed to do. Gogol would have enshrined him. He was perfect for dead souls. He had failed to go to the root of any problem. For a majority of TV-watching Americans, it was likely that Clinton was, by now, the most fascinating character to come along since J.R. That large share of American viewers would not wish the Clintons to go off the air. Indeed. Well, as Art Buchwald put it, think about it. When did you ever see a candidate on TV talking to a rich guy? That was cited from a local publication called Otherwise. Well, as Herbert Melville put it, though in many of its aspects this visible world seems formed in love, the invisible spheres were formed in fright. And I do believe I will take a brief break, but be right back. At this point, let us pause in the proceedings for station identification. You are tuned to Cafe Cabaret. This is the wrong hero in strenuousness. Please stay tuned because there's more. Well, we're back after that brief break for station identification. We will resume the topic of strenuousness. Now, I guess I made a ghastly blunder here. I was supposed to set the timer, but I didn't, so... Rest assured, we have about 22 minutes left, and in about 22 minutes, I will, in fact, get up and adjust the camera. In any event, we were talking about the events that led up to the 1996 presidential campaign. And in the course of this discussion, we were talking a little bit about some of the issues that were perhaps uh, hidden, but nonetheless consequential issues, class animus, which takes the form of a generational gap between the younger people who are beginning to resent the baby boomers for having coasted to their present positions of prominence in a seemingly effortless way. As Benjamin M. Friedman put it, 
What about all those who remember the past all too well, yet choose to repeat its mistakes nonetheless? Well, the thing is, I don't think that the younger generation is ever going to have quite the same opportunities as people of even my admittedly late-blooming generation have had. Thoreau, who every conservative should take to heart, even though he was for his day quite a radical, said, This government never of itself furthered any enterprise, but by the alacrity with which it got out of the way. Words that every libertarian could live by. We are trying to make the Federal Republic do an imperial job, said Felix Morley in the journal Human Events in the year 1957. He also stated that Albert J. Nock, like H. L. Mencken, was a Tory anarchist, that is, an anti-egalitarian individualist advocate of minimalist government. Now, all of these citations are taken from a new journal, which I think started up in the uh, fall of 1996 called The Independent Review. This matter of national defense, said J. Nock, would take on an entirely different aspect if people could be brought to understand that the only government they need to defend themselves against is their own government, and that the only way to defend themselves against it is by constant distrust and vigilance. Now, of course, that's those are the types of words that every militarist and uh, uh, militia member could live by. The requisites of empire, says uh, Mr. Garrett, the requisites of empire, executive domination, subordination of domestic policy to foreign policy, ascendancy of the military mind, a system of satellite nations, a complex of vaunting and fear, the call of historical necess necessity. And these indeed are words that every left-wing radical can live by. John T. Flynn in 1944 said, Militarism is the only great glamorous public works project upon which a variety of elements of the community can be brought into agreement, particularly the community of the southern states. We must have enemies, says John T. Flynn. They will become an economic necessity for us, because always the most powerful argument for a huge army maintained for economic reasons is that we have enemies. Frank Chodorov in 1948 said, What is it that perturbs the inquisitors? They do not ask, do you deny power? They too worship power. They limit themselves to the Communist Party. And this turns out to mean, have you aligned yourself with the Moscow branch of the church? He also goes on to state, no dictatorship has ever set a limit on its term of office. Although these words are perhaps not quite as true nowadays <coughs> as they were then, for after all, there is always a first time. Irving Lewis Horowitz stated, Political repression at times, and not infrequently, gives rise to cultural nuance not mechanically so much as in response to systematic evils. For example, environmentalism, to cite a modern-day example. He goes on to state, McCarthyism was able to extend further the already dangerously enshrined split between American culture and American politics. If culture is the source of 
ultimate ideals, politics in its purest form is the conduct of quotidian reality. A very, very good point. Because, as stated earlier, the Democrats are, in the words of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, attempting to use politics to shape the culture. Leo Strauss said, Repression may stimulate cultural creativity. Out of the search for an appropriate language of resistance emerges subtleties of language and symbols that may escape notice in more open societies. And to a certain degree, I suppose that's why the early 70s were such a hotbed of radicalism and sort of like um, there was a certain cultural impetus to the early 70s that was more or less lacking in the latter day 70s under the relatively more open Carter regime. However, in Great Britain, that was hardly the case. Because of joblessness, the punk rock movement arriving out of the situationists of Paris 1968 and previous were able to shape their culture. And with the rise of Reagan, punk rock eventually found its own nuanced form here in the United States. However, <coughs> by then it had become the precursors to alternative rock. It could well be that the uh, decline of alternative rock as a genre may very well have something to do with the decline of cultural repression and the subsequent emergence of an executive who is a Democrat. Culture serves to diffuse rather than stimulate potential opposition in the not so optimistic words of Irving Lewis Horowitz. Now if you wanted to know why even the pitiful 1% of those who did vote for Nader voted for Nader, Terry Mitchell stated in The Nation, I'm voting for Nader, but only because the rest of them are not fit to take out cat litter. Margaret Elysia Garcia said of the Green Party of California, The Green Party of California fails to realize that you can't dismantle the master's house with his tools, that their use of Nader's personality politics merely extends their play at politics a few more months, but does nothing to build a sustainable party or planet. Harsh words, but as ever, with a vital germ of truth. there's a certain existentialism to modern day politics which other more notable people have pronounced upon. Politicians are like toilet fixtures. It's enough that they serve their intended purpose. They need not be beautiful. Well, that's Joe Elsop, but of course, uh, he has uh, does not have exactly the most admirable of track records when you take into mind that he was one of the leading political pundits of the 60s who insisted upon the United States' involvement in Vietnam. Midge Decker, who of course is not somebody I would ordinarily cite, said, Scandal is fast becoming the great profit center of the American publishing industry. Now that, that leads back to 
the sort of existential politics that we currently enjoy. And in, in an existential world, the philosophy is basically that there is nothing we can do to change things. At best, all we can do is comment upon the passing show. If you know exactly what is needed in the way of new programs and legislation, as every leftist does with certainty, then what right has anyone to question either your behavior or your motives, says Midge Dector, rather scathingly, about Hillary Rodham Clinton. And that's just the thing about leftists. I mean, uh, they have this holier-than-thou attitude. Um, of course, the Republicans are no better, because if it doesn't make money, then they have no real use for it. <laughs> or if it doesn't promise to save money down the road, they certainly have no real use for it. I always said, says Charles Rangel, I always said that the worst place for a person to be is between President Clinton and his re-election. Maureen Dowd in Rising Time, the official magazine of the Republican Party, said, Bill Clinton personally, perfectly reflects the confessional, narcissistic, cynical, opportunistic, personality-driven times. And again, this is what I mean by a sort of existential politics. Perhaps that's one reason why the 1996 election was so relatively lifeless. Because it was the first existential election. You know, my girlfriend's an existentialist. And I gave her a disengagement ring. And here's something very amusing that Tom Harkin said. I wonder what Dole would say if he were alive today. Well, not a very nice thing to say. Paul Starr on the Dick Morris flap. When I first heard that Dick Morris had been caught with a prostitute, I thought he might have just been by himself. Well, <coughs> this current jail to the chief campaign that the Republicans are carrying out seems very suspiciously like the very same campaign that diehard liberals were carrying out against Richard Nixon back in the Halcyon days of 1973 and 74. Once more, the moral to be drawn from this is the more things change, the more they remain the same. Speaking of existential campaigns, if there was a candidate for office in 1996 who bucked the existential trend and, of course, lost as a result. It was Bob Dole who snapped when it looked like he was going to lose the election by a thundering margin of 20 points or more. I wonder sometimes what people are thinking about, or if people are thinking at all. Wake up, America. You're about to do yourself an injustice if you vote for Bill Clinton. For once, I suppose, the smooth, slick, professional politician facade of Bob Dole cracked on that occasion. It was just about that time that the whole thing with the uh, money for access to the White House deal started emerging in the press, which might have sunk Clinton's chances for re-election if it was not also discovered that, correspondingly, the Republicans were doing much the same thing, money for access. Neither party, in fact, was uh, to be uh, thoroughly exonerated of this charge. I guess the big difference is that it's news when you catch the Democrats doing it. Everybody expects the Republicans to do stuff like that. David Letterman said, in 
his top 10 ways Dole can get Perot to drop out. Give him a delicious cashew, then say, no more cashews until you drop out. For some reason that's incredibly funny, I don't know why. Well, now the end is near, and so we face the final curtain. Oh, ho, ho, ho. In any event, maybe the uh, best explanation for why Bill Clinton won re-election was stated by a fellow named Andre Phillips in McLean's magazine, the Canadian version of Time and Newsweek. He said, Seniors look at Bob Dole and they see another old guy. They look at Clinton and they see youth, vitality, what they were 10 or 20 years ago. So, I guess that's uh, one way to put it. Bob Dole sold his soul to win the presidency and is going to wind up with neither, said the New Republic in an editorial a little more than a week before the election. Joe Klein, citing William Julius Wilson, said, the disastrous impact of a crass, indulgent culture of affluence upon people without the social wherewithal or the personal confidence to delay gratification. I think he was talking about the lower classes. Those lower classes, you try soaking them out and scrubbing them out. But seriously, like sports fans who swarm towards the exits in a losing game, many in the GOP are trying to immunize themselves from post-election recrimination by filling newspaper editorial pages with self-serving excuses before the fact was the acerbic comment made in the New Republic of November 4th, a mere day before the election. If you want to speak to women, avoid using words like revolution or radical and extreme and grotesque. Use words like reform and un-American and compromise. Above all, you should avoid sports metaphors, says Kellyanne Fitzpatrick. We must now conclude our presentation very shortly. However, it might do us well to remember the words of Thomas Hobbes. Fear, should it become the overriding passion, breeds authoritarian solutions. Fortunately, we are not quite at that point yet. Again, commenting on the existential nature of the 1996 presidential election. Gloria Borger said, small-time pandering is all that seems left in this election. This was in the issue of U.S. News and World Report of October 28th. Let us conclude then with some words by Louis Lapham in the 
Harper's of November 1996. Instead of being offered antique oratory or finely worked as finely worked as a Tiffany lamp, memorable phrases, eloquent debates in old wooden rotundas, the voice of William Jennings Bryan, we are being presented with freeze-dried sound bites meant to be dropped into boiling water on Larry King Live. Oh, the existentialness of it all. We begin to appreciate, says Harry Shearer, the guys at the national level for, at the very least, their ability to fully milk a figure of speech. As I was saying, Bush should have done with Look at Arkansas. Robert Stone on the religious right at the 1988 GOP convention. Now, there was a convention. Swinish, ham-faced priests with morning whiskey breath and NRA buttons. Minyans of wild-eyed desert rabbis of the thorn-in-the-eye school. Brigades of smiley, dissembling Ku Klux clergy. Make handlers, snake handlers, weevil sniffers, pretend lunatics in Armani suits. And that, I think, is about as good a way as any to conclude. So let us conclude for now this presentation of Café Cabaret. Good night. I guess we're going to call an early quit to tonight's programming. This has been The Wrong Hero in strenuousness. You have been tuned to Café Cabaret next week when we present The Wrong Hero in A Show Trial, part three of our ongoing series on politics.